Hey team, there's four of you here today out of 11, so I figured I would make a video and make sure that you're keeping up to date at home. So this is continuing what we started on Friday with succession. I'm just going to do the whole PowerPoint again and you can skip ahead if you feel the need. Alright, so this is I think the third last PowerPoint. And remember with this you need to explain ecological succession and you need to refer to pioneer and climax communities and seers. You need to differentiate between primary and secondary succession and identify the key features of pioneer species that make them effective colonisers. We touched on this on Friday, but I'll reiterate it again in this PowerPoint. All right, so we talked on Friday about ecosystems being subject to change, and that change can be regular, irregular, short term or long term. Okay, so examples of regular change would be day night cycles seasonal changes across the year and lunar cycles because that's going to affect tides and marine environments. Irregular change would be random things that don't happen regularly like day and night and seasons. So chance events like flood, fire, earthquake, tsunami, any kinds of change that wouldn't be planned for or expected. Short term change would be day and night. So only very short change happens quickly. Long term change could be seasonal it happens across a whole year, could be changes that happen to the whole ecosystem over long periods of time. When we talk about successional change, that means changes occurring to the whole ecosystem. All right, now this is looking at succession in a forest environment, and we're looking at a change in an ecosystem where one community is replaced by another more complex one. We can see from the diagram at the bottom, we've got years and we've got um, a disturbance happening at the zero year mark. And we can see that there's abandoned farmland there on the left. And we can see the next little column, at the, I'm gonna highlight it just to highlight. Where am I? Oh my gosh, okay. Oh, that's not a highlighter. Ah. Okay, so pioneer communities. That was one of the definitions at the beginning. And a pioneer community is the community that's the first to replace um, a ecosystem after a disturbance. Often these are ones that are able to cope with very harsh environments. So we've got grasses and weeds here appearing within a year and small shrubs. These would be really well suited to the harsh, dry environments. They're going to have a lot of sunlight and probably poor soil quality. Um, now over time you can see these intermediate communities where we've got a lot of different kind of sh larger shrubs, pines, more mature pines and then eventually we get to the point where there's a whole heap of species and the ecosystem is really established and mature and I'm just going to hide me over here. You can see that this is the climax community over here which is the point where the ecosystem is really stable and functioning at its maximum. Um, okay, now a seer is that term that is talking about a community that has replaced the previous community. So, for example, the small shrubs would be a seer that have replaced the grasses and weeds. So they're kind of just little successive communities that have replaced the previous ones. The first seer are going to be the pioneer communities. Um, so each, they're going to be getting replaced over time um, as they go. All right, now we talked about important things with the pioneer communities. They're the first community to inhabit an uninhabited area. I mentioned that this area is generally really harsh, exposed, lots of sunlight, and it's going to be lacking soil nutrients and probably moisture and water supply. The pioneer species are adapted to this sort of environment and they take advantage of being able to thrive in those environments and also thinking to our competition, they take advantage of the fact that there is very little competition when they first establish an area. Um, this also um, allows these species to inhabit the area and then make changes to the area that are going to benefit subsequent communities. All right, so those important features of pioneer species, they are very well suited to tolerating those extreme conditions. And there's a few key things that make them suited to that. 
The first is their ability to do nitrogen fixation. Remember when we talked about nutrient cycling, we talked about nitrogen being really important in the soil and some plants are able to um, better fix nitrogen than others. So typically pioneer species are going to be able to do nitrogen fixation really well um, and that means that they're going to have a high number of these soil bacteria that are able to fix nitrogen and turn the nitrogen from the air into nitrogen that can be taken up by the plant and that's really important to start establishing a healthier ecosystem. The second thing is that they're usually shade intolerant which means that they are structurally better suited to high sun environments. That means that they can photosynthesize really well and they can also cope with having full sun and very little shade. The third point is that they are very good R-selected strategists, which means that they can disperse their seeds really rapidly or spores if they reproduce by spores and they often grow really quickly. So that's good because it can allow them to spread across the ecosystem easily, but it also means that we can start photosynthesizing and increasing nutrients in the soil a lot quicker because they're reproducing so rapidly. So it kind of works hand in hand with the other points. Um, as I mentioned before, the pioneer species are really useful because they can make the conditions in that barren ecosystem a lot more hospitable for other species. So because they're increasing nutrient levels, it makes it a more um, hospitable environment for these other species that come after that to um, thrive in. And what we mentioned on Friday is that once the ecosystem does become more complex and there's more nutrients available and it's a little bit more hospitable, we often see that the pioneer species start to decline in number because they're outcompeted by the newer arrivals and so we expect that they decrease in number. Um, as we get more and more stable towards the climax community, we start to see species appearing that are K strategists. So the, the bigger, more mature trees that live a lot longer and don't necessarily reproduce and spread seeds as readily by any means because they're often big, they're establishing canopies and we don't need to be dispersing a lot of, a lot of them because then they're going to start to take over as well. So generally K strategists there. All right, I think this is where we roughly got to in the last lesson. So looking at the climax community. And so these are going to be the final stages of an ecosystem development after a successive event. So generally, if we have a climax community, it's going to be a really stable and um, diverse environment. Um, it's usually complex, so there's a large number of different species and a lot of them and different strata that are all working together and interacting. So tundra, grassland, desert and forests are generally considered um, climax communities if they are um, thriving and doing well. Even though when you think desert you don't think biodiverse, you can still have climax communities within those kinds of ecosystems. You just wouldn't expect to see as much as you would in a rainforest. All right, now having a look, this is a comparison table of pioneer species, so those first ones to establish an area and climax species, the ones that are there when the um, community's matured and at its best. So in terms of photosynthetic um, efficiency, we know that the pioneer species can function really well with high light intensities. They're well suited to having full sun and they can cope with that. The climax species need relatively low light in order to thrive. So often, because we've got so many different levels of the strata within that ecosystem, generally the plants don't need as much light. They're usually sheltered by um, a canopy, different layers within a forest, for example, so they're not, um, not able to tolerate as high a light intensity. Therefore, when they're at low light levels, pioneer species don't like that. They thrive off the higher light, so they don't do very well, which is suited to these barren environments. Climax species can tolerate low levels of light. They're able to um, photosynthesize effectively at that lower level of light. Um, 
So photosynthetic rate is really high in the pioneer species because they're taking in maximum sun. Climax species, not as high. Um, and that, that works for them because they, they are species that are suited to low levels of photosynthesis. They can thrive in that environment. Seed number, pioneer species are high because they are strategists. They're wanting to disperse seeds. And the point below is that they disperse the seeds really far. And that relates to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier with increasing population number. Conversely, the climax species don't produce as much seeds because there's not a need to continue to um, spread these numbers. And so they don't disperse the seeds very far either. Relating to that as well, you've got the seed viability. So that's how long the seed is able to be um, useful or um, like it's still kind of alive. So the pioneer species, the seed remains viable for really long periods, whereas the climax species, short periods. Plant size, the pioneer species are generally small and there's a lot of them. The climax species are large, big and mature trees. Um, all right, now the next few points are relating back to our growth that we've been talking about. So the growth rate in pioneer species is rapid or exponential, and we should expect to see that J curve, the exponential growth, where there's a lot of them and they multiply really quickly. But they won't live long because they will eventually be overtaken by the next seer, and so they will be outcompeted. The climax species grow really slow, thinking of your big forest trees. And they'll follow that S-shaped logistic curve where they get to a point where they reach a, a maximum carrying capacity and they don't continue to increase in numbers after that. They generally live really long um, lifespans. Okay, so some examples of succession. Um, if we think about the zonation within mangrove swamps and salt marshes, salt marshes are really harsh and barren and generally as a mangrove ecosystem starts to become established you'll get different zones where you have mangrove species that can tolerate the high salt environment so they'll kind of start taking over that area and then eventually as they move away from the saltiness and those salt tolerant species are taking up salt and excluding salt from the soil that's going to make it more hospitable for other species that aren't so salt tolerant. Um, there's a few other examples there, a lake undergoing eutrophication, um, a new land forming um, and land that has been disturbed by human activity or any form of natural disaster. So that could be looking at re-establishing areas after the bushfires, um, it could be deforestation and then having to re-establish. Um, there's a few examples and you guys are going to work through these in handout 3.2.6. Um, and that'll give you a bit more of an example of these. And then I've also got this handout, which is on ecological succession. It gets you to look at primary and secondary succession, and then looking at a wetland example. So it's nice and relevant for us up here. Okay, now this is that mangrove um, zonation that I was talking about. So I'm gonna hide me again. Um, you can see different things establishing at different levels of the um, mangrove swamp area and it's to do with different tolerance to salt as well as different levels of water tolerance being inundated. Um, so algae and stuff can obviously live under the water, they can thrive in that environment and then we get sea grasses and then often you'll have some mangroves with these really big stilt roots that can, um, they those roots are specifically designed to be able to have them in um, tidal areas gives the plant structure and then up on the land where you only have a little bit of inundation you generally have these salt marsh areas which are really barren because it's high salt and often when the that's only inundated in king tides so when that lowers again you just end up with all of this salt on the land and it's not very hospitable. Um, following that you're going to have grasses, melaleuca woodlands and eucalypt forests as you get higher up and further away from the salty regions um, and they can tolerate that environment. Um, okay, this is the um, turning of a lake into a paperbark woodland. 
So we start with a, a lake or a pond and some soil. There's not much else going on. But if you think back to when you did um, weathering and erosion, you get some sediments build up over time in lakes. And that sediment often contains nutrient and other things. And so over time you can see um, pioneer species starting to develop. And over time that would turn into a more complex woodland ecosystem. All right, now primary and succession is, sorry, primary and secondary succession is really important because it's looking at two different examples of succession. Primary succession is talking about colonizing a previously uncolonized area. So it has never been colonized. And so, for example, that could be bare rock being inhabited by lichens. Um, it could be seagrass coming onto a bare seabed and we get new land and mangrove swamps forming from that. It could be bare lava flows, so really harsh environments where there's been lava being colonized. Um, secondary succession is when there was a disturbance to a previously colonized area. So that would be if we're clearing for farmland, um, burnt areas. Um, it could be areas that have had a established ecosystem and the floods have gone through there. And so they were once vegetated, but they've been disturbed. So often there may still be some remnants of nutrient in those in secondary succession examples. Okay, now this is an example of secondary succession where you had a flourishing forest ecosystem here on the left, lovely forest, climax community. And for some reason it's been cleared because people don't care for the environment and they have cleared the forest. This has left the forest with a really open area, high light levels, and only our um, pioneer communities can tolerate such um, barren conditions. So we're going to get grasses invading. And then as they start to grow and develop more, multiply really quickly, they're going to be putting nutrients back into the soil making the area more hospitable. So we see shrubs and tree seeds coming in. As these higher species start growing here, we're going to get more shade cover so we can have more tree species or little shrub species that are shade tolerant. So they can actually have a little bit of shade rather than being fully exposed to the light. And eventually we get the returning of the forest over a long, long time. So that's secondary succession. All right, so from the lesson, you need to explain succession. You need to know pioneer and climax communities. You need to know the two different types of succession, primary and secondary, and then be able to rattle off those um, pioneer species features that allow them to be really effective at colonizing a new area. Um, all right, now, as I said, it'd be good if you did worksheet um, 3.2.6 and this ecological succession handout. Those of you who aren't at school and might not be coming back, I'll do up the answers to these and scan them. So I won't have blank copies for you, but you can have a read of them and read my suggested answers and post any questions or things like that that you might have.